Greetings, my name is Grant Potts. I am a professor of religion at Austin Community College. Um, this is a lecture, the third lecture in a series of lectures I've been putting together for my um, introduction to comparative religion classes at Austin Community College on classical theories of religion. Uh, these lectures are all linked to theorists um, that are excerpted in Daniel Powell's Introducing Religion. And you'll notice when you're uh, watching these lectures that uh, I do reference directly quotes from the writers that I'm discussing. All those quotes can be found in the page numbers referenced in Daniel Powell's Introducing Religion Readings from the Classic Theorist, uh, which is available through Oxford University Press. Today I'm going to be talking about a key issue in the academic study of religion, uh, which is religious experience. When we look at religious experience, it tends to move us into a set of questions that often, not always, but often for many writers and many people who study religion, suggests that uh, purely social analysis, uh, the type of analysis you'd find in the sociology or anthropology of religion, or from disciplines like folklore or even literature, are not necessarily sufficient for examining the nature of religious experience. Uh, that is an argument that's, that's put up. It's definitely contested by um, other writers. But that argument that there is really something unique to religious experience has a history, and it's a history that's really anchored in the writings of the two people I want to look at today. Uh, those are William James and Rudolf Otto. Um, William James is an American writer, uh, a philosopher, and one of the leading lights of psychology um, and psychology of religion in the United States from the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, Rudolf Otto is a German writer, a German theologian, also from around the same time, although just slightly later, uh, who is very influential on theology, particularly Protestant theology, and um, on comparative religion and the broader academic study of religion because he uh, was one of the earliest um, thinkers on religion coming out of a theological tradition to really try to think through the issues he was confronting in a comparative perspective. Um, both basically are going to put forward uh, an argument that we need to develop a uh, particular understanding of religious experience that uh, doesn't rely on other um, outside analytic frameworks. Uh, although James will be a little more comfortable with a purely psychological understanding or a purely psychological study. Though both will basically be arguing that there is something fundamental going on in religious experience that can't be reduced to some other analytic frame. So both really do stand in um, what I've often discussed um, in these lectures and other other ways as a non-reductionist or religionist or phenomenological tradition. Um, and I've made this, this assertion a number of times that the academic study of religion has historically had two major currents. And these currents are in dialogue, um, but these currents also uh, are somewhat at odds with each other. And one of those currents is this religionist, non-reductionist um, or phenomenological tradition, which attempts to really develop a set of methods for understanding religion that do not reduce religion to some other aspect of human life, human life like the uh, sociology of religion, or the psychology of religion, um, even necessarily reducing it to a literary understanding of religion. The other, the other side is usually what I describe as the social scientific tradition. Um, and the social scientists tend to favor methods which really do want to look at religion uh, within those other frameworks. Um, whether they think religion is reducible to that or not, they may uh, at least argue that an academically rigorous method for studying religion needs to be anchored in a set of critical traditions that don't assume that there's something special about religion. Let's talk about William James. William James um, is uh, a major thinker. Uh, he's a monster of American thought. He really uh, sets off so many different currents uh, that it's hard to to 
it's easy, I should say, to underestimate his influence both on American thought and on world thought. He's one of the founders of the philosophical tradition of pragmatism, um, with other figures uh, from that era, like Dewey, who all really developed this, this tradition of philosophy, which is an American tradition of philosophy uh, with its own metaphysics, its own epistemology, um, etc. Uh, he was a professor at Harvard from 1873 to 1907. At various times, he's a professor of first physiology. Um, then he becomes more interested in kind of the inner world um, and becomes a professor of psychology. He's also at other times a professor of philosophy. Uh, so he's He's a, he's a very uh, wide-ranging mind. He has a lot of interests. Um, he's teaching at a major institution in the United States and um, writes quite uh, extensively on a number of topics. When it comes to religion, he's most well-known for his comments on religion in the varieties of religious experience, which was published in 1902. And this is the, the portion of his writings that Powell chooses to excerpt. Um, this text is extremely influential on the study of religion, particularly in the United States, but also um, influences the uh, study of religion worldwide. You'll see other uh, writers quoting or referencing him, uh, even if they're coming out of a continental European context. Um, or other contexts, you know. For example, there's there's a lot of influence of William James uh, on the Japanese study of religion um, as well. The um, the other thing you want to know about James is that he his own personal life uh, seems caught up with a lot of what he's examining um, in the varieties of religious experience. For one, um, he is. Uh, He's a member of the Theosophical Society. He, he joins the Theosophical Society, which is a uh, universalistic tradition anchored in traditions of Western esotericism, uh, still around today, uh, but ba was, was based off the writings and teachings of a woman named Madame Blavatsky uh, that looked toward a kind of universal wisdom, a, um, a universal spirituality underneath all the different world religions. And so part of what he's really trying to understand, you can see in that and in his own writings, a desire to get to what will often later be called a perennial philosophy or perennial sort of universal um, spirituality within humanity. The other thing is he is someone who seems to have suffered from um, depression. And, and so as a psychologist, he's very interested in uh, what we would probably think of as clinical depression today, uh, but melancholy and those those things that grip people um, and make it difficult for them to uh, to engage with the world in a happy and uh, you know easygoing way. And and as we'll see when we look at the varieties of religious experience. Um, in many ways, his argument there is anchored in this concern for depression. Uh, when he opens up his argument, when he opens up the varieties of religious experience, uh, which you also want to know were, were based on a series of lectures he gave in Scotland called the Gifford Lectures um, in 1901 and 1902 at uh, Edinburgh. But he uh, he opens first by defining religion and really looking at religion and thinking about it um, in terms of, for his purposes, he'll say, I want to think about religion as a, a way of, uh, the, a way that people deal, uh, engage with what's most important to them, with something transcendent in their private spaces. So religion for him is something very inner, very psychological. But as he's setting up then his argument, the, the major thing he um, sets up is this idea that there is there are kind of two psychological modes we engage in healthy mindedness and what he calls the sick soul and he says that for many people they go through their days um, they have a tendency to see look at the world and 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 interpret them in a positive light to see good in the world um, and that this is a this is a healthy psychological disposition uh, there's there's a point at his 
in his writings where he basically, in the Varieties of Religious Experience, where he says, yeah, and I understand many of you, he's talking to an audience, a learned audience that may, may uh, he kind of assumes is not necessarily uh, on board with the importance of religion. He says many of you probably don't understand religion and the importance of religion because you have a good life. You you you're, you have a disposition that tends to see the positive in things. But there's a bunch of us, he says, which don't have that. And we need a process for overcoming that. But he does go um, a little deeper. And I think this quote captures that because he, he sees this, this disposition, which he calls the sick soul, as... Um, as perhaps, while it may not produce a healthy psychological state, may be more philosophically uh, profound. He says, the method of averting one's attention from evil and living simply in the light of good is splendid as long as it will work. He's saying, this is great. You know, being able to have this healthy-mindedness is, is what we want as long as it, you can keep it up. But it breaks down potently, he says, as soon as melancholy comes. And even though one be quite free from melancholy oneself, there is no doubt that healthy-mindedness is inadequate as a philosophical doctrine, because the evil facts which it refuses positively to account for are a genuine portion of reality. And they may, after all, be the key to life's significance, and possibly the only openers of our eyes to the deepest levels of truth. So when, when James is trying to understand religion, and he'll understand this through um, an understanding of religious experience, through a number of different types of experiences, that's going to make um, the, uh, that's going to form the, the, the bulk of his inquiries. What are these kinds of experiences that we can define as religious experiences? But when he sees religion, he sees religion as a kind of psychological response. Um, a response that ultimately he's going to suggest is a response that isn't just a compensating uh, response. It's not that uh, as Freud or other psychologists of religion might look at um, religion as uh, a mode of transference. Uh, Freud sees it as a delusion, um, or I wouldn't say a delusion, at least an illusion, um, and an illusion that may have some, some positive psychological effects um, in as much as it sustains himself. Uh, James is actually going to suggest that, that there is a way in which religion turns our, our ideas away from, from just the evil in the world. But it, it does that by, he'll suggest, focusing on what he does see as a, a perhaps deeper and more profound truth. As he begins his investigation, he begins to look at say, at this issue of, of the fact that we seem to have a divided self, that there's part of us that sees what's positive in the world and part of us that sees what's negative in the world. And the part that sees um, what's negative in the world can come to overcome us, uh, and, and religion or a kind of religious understanding of the world... and. Keep in mind that when he opened his argument on religion, he doesn't define religion as we often would define religion in the academic study of religion today as the kind of social, political institutions and traditions um, associated with what we call religion, um, but as this kind of inner disposition toward reality. And the first thing he's going to really look at as a type of experience uh, is the experience of conversion. The experience where one begins to shift one's perspective away from the, the, the part of ourselves that sees in the world evil, that sees in the world suffering, that brings us into the state of melancholy, to a part of ourselves which sees, which doesn't necessarily neglect those. I mean, that's the key. Is like he, he kind of does seem to suggest that there is a kind of naive, healthy-mindedness we all have. Um, that then may be broken. We might think of this as a kind of innocence um, we have as children, where the world looks great, um, but then something something basically opens us up to the um, the reality of evil, the reality of suffering, 
and our heart becomes fixated on that. It loses that healthy-mindedness um, and goes into this state of becoming a sick soul. And then he, he then returns. Yeah, I think he sees that there's a return through a process he calls conversion to something a little more healthy, which doesn't, which actually is a different state than this kind of naive, healthy-mindedness. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and so what he's really trying to work out then is to, to say what happens in this conversion. And this quote from, from Varieties helps us get at that. He says, it makes a great difference to a man whether one set of his ideas or another be the center of his energy. So in our, the center of who we are and our energy, how we act, um, we often have something at the center and other things that are peripheral. He, he does have this kind of say, there's part of us that sees good in the world, there's part of us that sees evil in the world. Um, and it makes a big difference which part we put at the center, what's at the periphery. It makes a great difference as regards to any set of ideas which he may possess, whether they become central or remain peripheral to him. To say that a man is converted means, in these terms, that religious ideas... Ideas of you know uh, a religious nature, and this and this he is kind of getting at the ideas that we would associate um, with religious traditions. But he sees those ideas as emerging in those traditions out of some more fundamental experience. I think that's what we want to recognize. Uh, religious ideas previously peripheral to his consciousness now take a central place, and that religious aims form the habitual center of his energy. So. Those ideas, ideas of uh, divine goodness in the world, um, those ideas of um, you know of of surrender to that goodness, um, those ideas of freedom, and joy, and and ways of being that emphasize those. Um, that's what defines conversion. And what does conversion lead us to? Conversion uh, leads us into that religious life. Uh, to a, a positive state. So not just an experience, but a state that he defines as, quote, the fruits of, the, of religion. And that state, that state is what he calls saintliness. Saintliness is... Um, is a term that he says he gives to the collective name for the ripe fruits of religion. And uh, if you're looking at Powell's and reading along with me, go to page 182 and 183, and you'll see um, you'll see where he outlines uh, what this is. Now, I want to stop here because I want to I want to point out that this is part of what tends to define a more phenomenological approach to religion. It tends to posit a, um, a religious nature to things, and then, like we saw with Eliade, we'll try to outline what that looks for. Well, this is sometimes described as, uh, for forgive the repetition, uh, this is sometimes described as, quote, descriptive phenomenology, end quote, where there's, there's an attempt to describe and outline the features of these posited religious states or um, experiences. And the two that really form the heart of James's discussion will be saintliness and then mysticism, a mystical state, uh, which is more of a temporary state that people enter into. Um, so what are what is saintliness? Well, he says saintliness is defined by um, a number of features. Uh, which we can see in people who have attained to this kind of saintly state. Uh, first, he says that there's um, a, a way in which uh, our being, he says a feeling of being in a wider life that is of the world's, uh, that of this world selfish, uh, sorry, forgive me, I, I read this with improper emphasis. He said that these, one of the th features is a feeling of being in a wider life um, that is wider than that of this world's selfish little interests, and a conviction not merely intellectual, but as it were sensible of the existence of an ideal power. So there's something greater than us. There's something that extends beyond our selfish interest in the worlds, and we have a feeling of that as 
uh, a, a nature of being. So there is this this sense of the divine, or if we we're using a more general state uh, language, a sense of the sacred. And then there is, he says, a feeling of self-surrender to that ideal power. There is a giving over of oneself to the sacred. Um, and then from that, there is a sense of immense elation and freedom. There's joy um, that comes with the, um, the, the destruction of that selfhood, of that ego. And as that occurs, this develops a more positive focus on the world. What he says um, is a shifting of the emotional center towards loving and harmonious affections towards, quote, yes, yes, and away from no, where the claims of the non-ego are concerned. Really what he's describing here is a, a sense that you, you get a sense that there's something bigger than you as you approach this state of saintliness. Um, and you surrender to that. Out of that develops a sense, a positive sense of freedom and of joy and reorients your, your focus on the world to the more positive aspects of the world. So note, this comes after that state of a sick soul. He then says that there's a number of... Um, conditions that come about as a consequence of this. So once this process is undergone, once one converts to a religious disposition um, through this process, one then will be marked by a certain number of conditions. One is asceticism. That self-surrender uh, will lead to a, a life which finds value in sacrifice, which finds value in um, turning away from much of material life, um, whether that is, you know, food or possessiveness, that uh, along with this, there is then a, a sense of an enlargement of oneself, an enlargement of life, and that uplifting um, freedom, which gives a strength to the soul and a strength to one's character. One doesn't suffer fear. One doesn't suffer anxieties. Um, one is able to be more uh, operational in life, um, that there is then also an increase in what he calls purity. Uh, it's good potentially to read uh, from the writings on page 23. The sensitiveness to spiritual discords is enhanced, and the cleansing of existence from brutal and sensual elements becomes imperative. Occasions of contact with sensual elements are avoided. So you actually, he says, you become more focused on religious things and try to conduct your life so that you don't uh, encounter those things which bring you into discord. And then finally he says there is, um, as the emotional center uh, moves away from this sort of egotistical uh, life, there is um, an increase of tenderness for our fellow creatures of charity, uh, of a concern for the world. You know, it. I think a critic of this would, would be quick to point out um, that this looks very, very much like a particular form of religion, um, even in the language of saintliness that is celebrated in the Christian tradition out of which, you know, and as much as, as James is a theosophist, as much as he is, you know, really interested in a kind of world spirituality, his model of religion still very much relies on a kind of... Um, Protestant um, uh, understanding of saintliness that, you know, we, we might even associate with um, the revival of experiential religion that Anne Taves talks about um, in her, her examination of American religion. And she ties a direct relationship between investigators like William James on the intellectual level and the broader revival of an experiential religion in America uh, with Methodism, with the Second Great Awakening, um, and even with, with movements like spiritualism and whatnot, all of which tend to have this sense of, you know, an, an experience of conversion which leads one to this kind of life which is charitable to others, which does not rely on material things, etc. Uh, so this looks, this looks like a very specific form of religion. Yet it is also something we can find this form, uh, even if it's not universal, 
across a number of religious traditions. That said, there are many religious traditions, you know, there are, there are examples of religious traditions where that experience isn't necessarily anchored in surrender, isn't necessarily anchored in the rejection of the material world, isn't necessarily anchored in an obsession with purity or charity. Um, so there is reason to potentially uh, question the universality of this for understanding religion, though there might be some some ways in which this does at least give us a sense of a type of religious experience that's important. Now, when talking about religious experience, what most people go to, and probably the most excerpted and read section of the varieties of religious experience uh, and quoted and referenced is his discussion of mysticism, which is on page 188 and 189 of the Pals Reader. Um, and similarly, what he he's really uh, he says basically when he gets to it, like I've been talking about these states, you know, there there is, uh, but there are these like specific states where people have a sense, a real intense sense of the sacred uh, or the divine that he he talks about as mysticism. And he says I haven't really talked about this once. He gets to the that point of the book, so we need to outline what mysticism is. And and this is like when we think of religious experience, often the model is based off mysticism. And in a similar manner to what he did um, with his discussion of the um, of saintliness, he discusses mysticism by outlining its features. Now, what does he mean by mysticism? It's clear that what, what James is getting at are these intensive states of a sense of connection with the divine, um, uh, what later writers will often call unitative states, that we find um, reports of in various traditions. We find them in Christianity, amongst the mystics within Christianity. We find them in Islam, amongst mystical traditions like Sufism. We find them in the ascetic traditions of South Asia, um, and those influenced by them, like yoga, like Buddhism. So we do find these around the world, and there's, there's a lot of interest in the, these uh, states that are often brought on by contemplative prayer, by meditation, etc. Uh, or, but sometimes people suggest these come about of their own accord. When James turns to mysticism, he's interested in, in really saying what's going on with this state. What happens when people achieve these intense states that are brought about by meditation, by yoga, by contemplative prayer? And when he looks through and surveys the reports, and what you don't get as much in Pals, what's often left, what is left often in Pals is, is the evidence, because uh, James in the Varieties of Religious Experience, a vast majority of that book is just reports of case studies that he's going through um, to provide the evidence for his analysis. We get much of the analysis. Um, but as he surveys those, he says he, he sees a number of common features. First off, he says that there's there's a way in which um, mysticism really provides us with a different order of reality, an experience of a different order of reality. And I think this is really what's important for understanding then, uh, going back to even that state of saintliness, why uh, James gives so much weight to religion um, and religious experiences. Because he actually does argue that the mystic in these mystical states is becoming aware of a different order of reality. But it's an order of reality that he defines by ineffability. He says, um, quote, the subject of it, of the mystical state, immediately says that it defies expression and that no adequate report of its contents can be given in words. And you do often find this in uh, reports of mystical experiences where there will be this sort of preface where uh, in giving that report, the person says, I can't really describe what the experience was like, but then goes on to try to describe it um, through sort of an outline that references it, which is exactly what, what, what James is doing. He says, this is something that escapes words. This is something that escapes description that we can't really grasp and communicate to others. But note, he does really suggest that it's something we can't communicate. It's ineffable. 
He really thinks um, that we can't grasp it, at least in the moment, at least in the moment of the mystical state, even though it defies expression, we are having an experience where we are apprehending this greater order um, we're apprehending, uh, which if you were using for him Christian language would be the nature of God or the nature of reality. And in this, he says, mystical states have a noetic quality. They give knowledge um, they, that this is a state of knowing. Uh, uh, mystics often report having a, a, an absolute conviction that is now anchored in knowledge. So it's an experiential state that gives knowledge in the same way that other experiential states gave knowledge, although that knowledge is of a different order. Think about this. So how do we actually gain knowledge? We gain knowledge through experience. Um, we can read, but even when we read, if we trust that as knowledge, it's based on fundamentally experience. Uh, so if I know that, for example, water is wet, it's because I've experienced the wetness of water. Um, and he suggests that, that the mystical state is not an illusory state. Um, it's not purely a psychological state um, of illusion that then may have some positive effects, but it is a state in which we actually come to know that greater order of reality. But there are um, two other characteristics that he thinks are important. Uh, the One is the transiency. Even though we enter into the state and we know um, in that state the reality of God, let's say, we, we only have that temporarily. Mystical states are, he always says, temporary. They may give knowledge that we can then hold on to later, but we don't have that direct sense of knowing. Um, and they can only be, quote, imperfectly reproduced in memory. But when they recur, it is recognized. And from one occurrence to another, it is susceptible of continuous development in what is felt as inner richness and importance. So the more we have these, the more we can attain that state of saintliness he called, uh, he pointed to earlier. But we also do need to recognize that these come and go, that this is an intensive moment of knowing. Second, or finally, he says that the mystic... Um, experiences their the state as a completely passive state. Uh, this goes back to a long tradition, which is looking at religious experience, um, going back to an earlier uh, German theologian named Schleimacher as uh, a, a, an experience of ultimate dependence. When we're looking at religious experience, um, much of this goes back to, much of the way people talk about this goes back to that earlier writer, Frederick Schleimacher. And Schleimacher was, was really trying to understand uh, religious experience um, as this experience of dependence on something greater and more transcendent. Now, he doesn't use the language of dependence as much, uh, but he does say that it is passive, that the mystic experiences their own will as subsumed by something greater, by the divine. He says, Although the oncoming of mystical states may be facilitated by preliminary voluntary operations, you meditate, you pray, as by fixing the attention or going through certain bodily performances, i.e. ritual or in other ways which manuals of mysticism prescribe, yet when the characteristic sort of consciousness once has set in, he says, the mystic feels as if his own will were in abeyance, and indeed sometimes as if he were grasped and held by a superior power. There's something bigger than you that you now become part of. And that individual ego is submerged into a divine consciousness, for lack of a better word. I think that where there's a lot to really um, see here, that what is James doing as a scholar what he's doing is he's, he's investigating religion from a completely different direction than someone like Tyler might have been or Durkheim. Uh, he's, he's not concerned with religion as a social form. I mean, he accepts that that's there, and he, he even, I think, accepts that that might be interesting for investigation. But he also kind of argues that that's, this isn't going to get us what's important about religion. For him, what's important about religion is the religious part. Um, 
is that it, it that there is something going on in religion, uh, which he investigates primarily through these kind of psychological frequencies that we need to understand. And that we're not going to necessarily understand if we just rely on this um, understanding through a particular tradition, but through a comparative analysis. Now, a comparativist like Eliade, in contrast, is going to look at um, the wealth of myths, the wealth of the material of religion and religious traditions. James is going to make a different argument. He's going to say, no, there's, there's something going on here in an experience, uh, that there are individual human beings out there who, through religion, come to some knowledge, some understanding of the world. And that understanding may then be expressed in myth. It may be expressed in um, these various traditions. But we need to really focus on that experience itself in its most intense state, um, in its most intense states. And so he then focuses on these states of mysticism, of saintliness. And then we'll look at, again, comparative evidence, but comparative reports of what's going on in this, not necessarily the mythal material, the ritual material. All of that is of kind of secondary importance to him. But he's most interested in the more direct reports of people who claim to have these kinds of experiences. Now, as we move to Rudolf Otto, who you'll notice is really writing um, immediately following James, uh, soon after, you know, within a, a little over a decade after um, James, and is influenced by James and references James in his writings, we see someone who is also um, going to be trying to understand this more general um, thing, although he's going to anchor this more specifically in a Christian theological framework. Rudolf Otto um, is a German theologian. He's, he's part of an era in which, um, in especially, again, the Protestant world, if you were trying to look for the center of um, theology and developments in theology, uh, at least at that time, in, in what would be called uh, liberal theology um, today, you're going to look to uh, Germany. And, you know, there's more orthodox forms of this and more um, forms which are breaking more strongly from the tradition of theology. Uh, dogmatics uh, tends to be a little bit more orthodox. Apologetics uh, tends to be a little bit more um, progressive. Um, now, I mean, it's good to also, just as an aside, know that there are developments in modern theology that will become extremely influential by the end of the 20th century happening in the United States at that time, uh, which will develop into a more conservative, um, what we often label as fundamentalist form of theology, uh, which may have uh, as much, if not more, influence on the Christian world today. Uh, I'd say that the Christian world is probably about... Um, half and half between these two different trends in theology. But he's in that world, and that world is a world which is encountering um, secular philosophy um, and really trying to account for the Christian message within that, within that philosophy, uh, accounting for the reality of other religious traditions. And Rudolf Otto is really, really one of the people who is most um, engaged with this. He has an ongoing interest in Eastern traditions. He traveled throughout the world um, in the early 20th century. He spent time in East Asia and South Asia um, and really developed an interest in yoga and developed an interest in um, Buddhism and developed an interest in these other traditions of the world. He remains throughout his life a Christian. And if you read the book that Powell's excerpts, The Idea of the Holy, um, it is an apologetic text. Um, he goes through and does this comparative analysis of a phenomenon he calls the holy, and then the last chapter will be essentially an argument for why he believes that the Christian tradition, for any number of features that the tradition has, not necessarily um, historically um, or rooted in faith, but because of the way the Christian tradition structures its understanding of what's going on um, in the experience of the holy, is the truest tradition. And um, you know, it, that part, uh, comparativists and 
uh, scholars of religion who are not coming out of a theological problem tend to just sort of ignore uh, as his writing. It's important to know that it's there. Um, he is a, a devout Christian who sees Christianity as the best embodiment. But what's, I think, different than, say, a more very, a very conservative approach to Christianity is he doesn't necessarily think that, that the other traditions aren't grasping a true understanding of the divine. He just thinks that they're not doing it as well as Christianity is. Um, he is also a, a coming out of a major institution. He's a professor of theology at the University of Marburg from 1917. And again, like if we're looking to the center of the Protestant world intellectually in the early 20th century, not only would we look to Germany, we'd specifically look to Marburg. Uh, so he's a, a thinker who's coming out of an institutional framework, uh, just as James is coming out of Harvard, which is um, extremely important to the training of the leading minds of the next generation. Rudolf Otto is a little bit more of a theologian and a philosopher than James. He um, isn't necessarily going to be looking to a psychological state. Uh, he's going to be looking to a philosophical um, understanding of God as the beginning of his argument. So uh, he's going to open his argument in the idea of the holy instead with a... Uh, what do I want to say? Uh, uh, the problem he posits is more of a theological problem. And the, the problem he suggests is that theologians, and this is especially true of theology of his time, um, theologians are really looking toward a philosophical understanding of God. And, you know, if you look at the Christian tradition, there's a strong tradition which um, tries to understand God, um, if not through Scripture, so there's the whole tradition of scriptural um, interpretation for understanding the nature of the divine. But going back at least to scholasticism, but even further back into the, the fathers of the church, you find a strong tradition of theology and Christianity uh, rooted in rationalistic Greek philosophy, which Chen argues that we can understand God through reason. And much of theology is influenced by this attempt, you know, and in terms of its most explicit form of trying to understand the nature of God um, through doing this through reason. And he's going to say that, that there is an understanding of God that is rational, that may be important, um, and that is the framework of orthodoxy and the framework of, of dogma, but that this is not, this is not really what's concerned by what he calls the wildest mystics. It's not concerned, it's not the concern of, of people who actually have an experience of the divine. And that there is a different nature. There's a non-rational understanding of God that we also have to outline and understand as theologians. It says it is not simply that orthodoxy has preoccupied, uh, was preoccupied with doctrine, with the framing of dogma, for these have been no less a concern of the wildest mystics. So mystics are concerned with that. It is rather that orthodoxy found in the construction of dogma and doctrine no way to do justice to the non-rational aspect of its subject. And he will argue, kind of like, even if you look at dogmatics, at, at people who are looking at church doctrine or at scripture and attempting to understand it, that they're always trying to outline this in a rational aspects. So far from keeping the non-rational element in religion alive in the heart of religious experience, Orthodox Christianity manifestly failed to recognize its value, and by this failure gave to the idea of God a one-sidedly intellectualistic and rationalistic interpretation. So he says that the church, Christianity, has overemphasized, especially in its most elite forms, in Orthodoxy, the rational side. And we need to also understand, he says, the non-rational side that comes about in experience. So how do we do this? How do we do this? We do this by figuring out what's going on in religious experience. So we move back to um, experience, just as James did. And he, he argues that will understand this experience if we understand that there is a state of mind 
what he calls a sui generis state of mind um, called the numinous. Um, this is, and sui generis just means generated of itself, that there is an experiential state of being that humans have, that it's an experience of the numinous um, that is like no other experience humans have. To investigate this, he wants to investigate this word holy. He says that there is, we, we get at this when we use the word holiness. Um, holiness uh, or sacredness captures that state of being. He, he wants to separate this off, and if you're, on, if you're looking at uh, the reader, you would look at page 210 to 11 for what I'm talking about here, from two things, from rationality, what we, which we also already understand talked about, but also moral good. And part of what he's getting at is that in the Christian tradition, you know, saintliness, sacredness, holiness is associated with a kind of moral quality. And he suggests that might be there, but that that is, um, you know, even much like James argues, a result of an experience of the holy. Um, but that the holy, the experience itself, is something different, which doesn't necessarily have a moral frequency. Although people may lead more moral lives because of the experience of the holy, the state itself is not a moral state. And to investigate this, uh, in, in contrast to James, instead of doing a survey of case studies, he instead says, well, what is the language we use across different traditions um, to get at this? And what do those words mean? So he's going to investigate um, the root of the word holy, uh, das Heilig in German, and, uh, and he's going to say, well, what are the words we have for this? We have a Greek word, hagios. Uh, we have the Hebrew word, kadosh. And we have the Latin word, sasser. Or um, in, we might also look at sanctus, sanctified, a sacred uh, and he says that all of these have a connotation that doesn't necessarily associate it with kudosh. So the word we often translate as holy or we translate as sacred, uh, like when we translate the holy of holies in Hebrew, the word is kudosh. And he says that this is, it, well, we agree that the good is a, mid, uh, uh, a mistranslation. So we can't just think of the holy as the good. There's lots of good that isn't holy, um, and holiness seems to have something that is not just defined by the good. And what we're really getting at is what he then wants to say is the numinous. So what is the numinous? The numinous is the object of this experience of holiness. Uh, and when he, he describes it, he says, now this object is just what we have already spoken of, of as the numinous. This is on page 214. For the creature feeling and the sense of dependence to arise in the mind, the numen must be experienced as present, a numen presence, as in the case of Abraham. There must be felt, so, be felt something numinous, something bearing the character of numen to which the mind turns spontaneously, or which is the same thing. In other words, these feelings can only arise in the mind as accompanying emotions when the category of the numinous is called into play. So what he ultimately argues is that there's, there's a sense of what he calls creaturely feeling. And this is actually going to be um, the beginning of what he describes as the numinous. A, a sense um, which he roots in that idea of dependence I talked about from Schleimacher, but he, he wants to get away from that. And he says that you know it's a, a sense that there's something bigger than us, again, that we're morally uplifted into, and that we are subject to. Uh, there's a sense of relative dependence. It's not complete dependence. I think that's part of what he's getting at. It's a relative dependence. And uh, what does it mean to be a creature? It means to be a created being. That's all a creature is. It's something that's created. We often use the word creature to mean something like a monster, because that goes back to Frankenstein as the creature. Um, but Frankenstein was a creature because he is something that is created by Dr. Frankenstein. Uh, the monster is, is created by Frankenstein. And so to be a creature means simply that we are created. And again, you, you see the influence of Christian theology here, um, which puts a lot of emphasis on the creaturely nature of human beings, that they are created um, by a divine presence. Um, and so in the numinous, we become aware, we come into that kind of feeling that we are um, 
in relationship to something else. That something else is the numinous. So what is the character then of this? What, what then for really the rest of the excerpt that you have um, from Pals, uh, from the idea of the holy, and this really forms the heart of what is most used in the idea of holy in later writings. He suggests that that experience is an experience of something that is defined by um, what he calls mysterium tremendum and with fascination. I've sometimes heard this cited as mysterium tremendum and mysterium fascination, fascinatus, um, but I don't think I've, I don't think Otto specifically outlines it, it like that, although he may. Um, and so we have, we have three different then, again, look how he's using words. A lot of what he begins to do is to outline words and then investigate the words themselves. And in this way, he, he operates also like a lot of German philosophy and theology operates at his time. It's a different approach than James. James is going to the experience. James is going to go to the reports. He's sort of an empiricist. Um, it's very much like a, an American approach, uh, academic approach from his time. Otto's approach is much more like a German academic approach, which sees in the language itself and the way we describe things and the way we evolve language uh, a connection to a deeper experience and that we have to investigate those words, we can get at it. And so he says, what is, what is the tremendum? What is the mysterium? What is the fascination? Well, in tremendum, he says, there are really three characters. There's, there's an awfulness, a, a sense of awe in the face of something greater to us, something we can't understand, it's a, a mystery. Um, there is a sense that we're overpowered by the holy. There's a sense that we're overpowered by this sense of experience, uh, which he calls the majesty. And there's a sense of urgency, of energy, that this is happening right now, and that's really important. Um, and, you know, that, you know that, that it can't be simply dismissed. Uh, our heart races. There's something bigger than us. Um, and, and, you know, it's something close to fear. And there's points at which he suggests that we, we, we tremble before God, but that that trembling is not simply the same as fear. Fear in the face of uh, a danger or perceived danger approaches that but it's not the same. And part of it is this urgency and energy keeps us locked in to that trembling. And we're confronted by the awfulness of this face of mystery. And, and in that, he su suggests we see a, a second order to this experience of what the numinous is. It's tremendous. It's also a mystery. It's something wholly other than we are. And this is also part of the creaturely feeling. We are creatures what we experience as a creator. We are a different order of existence than that which we experience. Um, there's something that is fundamentally different than us, but that we are becoming connected to. Um, and that ultimately, from that, then we have a sense of fascination, of beauty, of wonder. Uh, there's a positive. It's not just trembling, but a, a sense of, of enrichment that happens in the experience of the holy it's very easy to see how this, this ties to a, a understanding of the divine anchored in the Judeo-Christian tradition um, of which Otto was such a part. But again, he's, he's suggesting that there is, like James, some, something happening in an experience that is bigger than us, uh, that is defined by a state which he wants to insist is not merely a psychological state. It's not just an inner state. And, and the, the mysterium is, is part of what's important for Otto. Um, it's, it is defined by something greater than us, something outside of us. Uh, there is something real there. So at the end of the day, if we want to kind of um, reflect on what's going on in these two writers, we can look at this and see that there's, there, there are some real commonalities to an understanding of experience. There's, there's a real sense that experience is there, that it's different than the social, that it's different than any particular experience, uh, that there's something real going on here, uh, something that maybe transcends religious traditions, although Otto does argue that Christianity in the end captures this experience the best. 
um, but this is something that is even greater than, say, a religious tradition um, that is being apprehended. Uh, but there are some, some important differences to how they approach this. Um, James sees this primarily as rooted in a psychological experience of the sickness of the soul that one then begins to turn away from. Otto sees this more in a, uh, a problem presented by philosophy and theology of you know the, the dryness, let's say, of a purely uh, rational discussion of God. Uh, James sees this as a kind of inner experience, something like a psychological experience. Otto wants to push it beyond that. I mean, and, and part of what you need to realize is that Otto has read James. He's responding to James, and he's dissatisfied with what feels like primarily an inner experience experience and says, no, there's something existential going on. There's something real going on. This is as much for Otto an experience of a reality as the experience of the wetness of water is when we're swimming. Um, it may be of a different order. It may be of something greater and wholly other. And then when James gets to a discussion of what's going on and why we don't capture this without looking experience, for him it's, it's the ineffability Whereas for Otto, it's the non-rationality. It defies rational categories. For James, it defies words. Uh, these are very similar, but they're also somewhat different. And it's important to ponder uh, maybe what's the, the significance of those differences. At the end of the day, though, what we see in both of these um, will be what is still an ongoing um, center of investigation for many people in religion an investigation which uh, looks for a kind of universal religious experience that underlies all other experiences, um, and an attempt to then outline what that is, uh, and, and usually with a sense that this is sui generis, that this is something um, of its own. Now, there is a whole body of the academic study of religion uh, that argues against this, that basically says this is a big rabbit hole, um, this is a lot of smoke and mirrors, and really all we're doing is putting together a lot of bits of evidence into nice stories to suggest there's something big going on. Um, and, you know, one thing that they'll suggest is that, you know, the ineffability that James talks about, the non-rationality that Otto talks about, um, creates its own kind of epistemological problem, its own kind of problem for, for even making the claim, methodological problem, that for even making the claim that we can describe these. Now, James and Otto both have their arguments. They both say, you know, we can outline this by looking at the residue, the effects of this experience, uh, because there is a connection between the ineffable, the non-rational, and the human. Um, but those other scholars will say, look, even if there's something going on, the academic methods of investigation are rooted in rationality. They're rooted in description. They're rooted in words. And so we can't responsibly describe those. We can only do the work of a, a social, scientific, or critical analysis of religion. But the argument that James and Otto makes persists, and there's, there continues to be a lot of people who, who don't buy it, who say just because um, we use words, just because we use reason, doesn't mean we can't investigate the ineffable or the non-rational. After all, most of everything we investigate um, is at its root not rational. Society is not rational. Um, solidarity that we saw in Durkheim is an experience, uh, you know, and, and so, so there's an ongoing debate around this uh, that continues today. Well, I hope you found this a valuable lecture and that this gave you some more insight into some important writers on religion. And I look forward to uh, investigating another set of writers in the future with you.